Welcome everyone to the 2021 Field Center Symposium, Family Defense and Child Welfare, Exploring the Role of Representation for Parents in Improving Outcomes for Children. We are so thrilled that so many of you have joined us for this timely and important discussion today. My name is Kara Fink and I direct the Interdisciplinary Child Advocacy Clinic at Penn Law School and I'm also a co-faculty director at the Field Center for Children's Policy, Practice and Research. I am particularly excited about this panel since I previously represented parents in one of the first institutional providers for family defense at the Bronx Defenders. This subject is near and dear to my heart and I am very excited to hear from our panel of experts. I wanna thank the Field Center for their support of this symposium and particularly Sarah Wash and Felicia Saunders who are instrumental in making today's event possible. I would also like to thank Penn Law School for their continued support of our work and especially Naoshi Giles who provided invaluable support to us in coordinating and planning our virtual symposium today. I'm thrilled to be moderating this discussion of our five interdisciplinary panelists, each of whom is an expert in their own right in family defense and child welfare. We will learn about the seminal study on the impact of enhanced parent representation from Marty Guggenheim and Tim Ross. And we will also hear from interdisciplinary advocates and leaders who are putting this model into practice here in Philadelphia as part of the Community Legal Services Family Advocacy Unit and their tireless efforts to reform the system for parents and children. But before we get to our speakers, I wanted to remind participants that we are recording this program and we'll also be offering CLE and CEU credits for today's webinar. If you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that the CLE codes will be presented twice per hour. Therefore, there will be three CLE codes in total. Please write down these codes and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. Please find the link to the evaluation form in the chat. Your first CLE passcode is GOAT. Again, that's GOAT, G-O-A-T. We have reserved time after the presentations for questions to the panelists. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of your window. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed from the webinar. And now it is my privilege to introduce the first two panelists, Professor Martin Guggenheim and Tim Ross. Marty Guggenheim, as many of you know, is one of the nation's foremost experts on children's rights and family law, and he has taught at NYU Law School since 1973. He not only created the Family Defense Clinic, which represents parents in foster parents of children of, in foster care in New York City, but has argued leading cases on juvenile delinquency and termination of parental rights in the Supreme Court. He is a prolific scholar who has focused his research on many issues, but most importantly for today's purposes, on the role of counsel for children in court proceedings, empirical research in child welfare practice, and family law. He's author of several books, most recently also What's Wrong with Children's Rights, but most importantly has been a staunch advocate of family defense um, and improving the representation for parents and family court for decades. Tim Ross is a managing partner at Action Research and has been an applied researcher for over 25 years with experience in the child welfare system and system reform. Prior to founding Action Research in 2010, Tim led the child welfare program at Child Trends and served as director of research at the Vera Institute of Justice. His work focuses on developing and evaluating interventions of involving permanency ser services for transition age youth, parent representation, and prevention services. He is also a member of the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation's advisory committee and has taught at both the NYU Silver School of Social Work and the City University of New York. It is my great pleasure to turn this over to them and to hear more about this critical and important study. Thank you uh, so much, Kara, um, for providing us the opportunity to start uh, the day by talking about um, a study that was done in New York City. Um, uh, just reading a note, uh, sorry. Um, I had uh, long believed two things about uh, parent representation in child welfare cases. Um, one is that despite its importance in terms of the consequences 
poor parents and children suffer from coercive intervention in their families, the field has been undervalued for most of its existence. A second belief is that lawyering really matters and providing parents the right kind of legal representation in these cases can mean the difference between preserving a family and seeing it permanently destroyed. The second belief that high quality legal representation can really make a difference in child welfare cases is something to which I committed the greater part of my career to proving. Until recently, we could only rely on personal experiences and anecdotes, uh, no longer. Uh, in May of 2019, uh, a study commissioned by Casey Family Programs and jointly investigated uh, by uh, Casey NYU and Action Research was published um, validating my long held belief. Um, Tim Ross, um, who was the principal investigator at Action Research is going to, he's the scientist, uh, I'm the advocate. Um, I wanna make clear that my involvement in the study uh, did not include my having access to any of the raw data. I was an expert consultant on practices in the court, um, answering the myriad questions about what does this mean? But I had no access to the data itself. Um, uh, using a poker uh, phrase, uh, I, I felt that I was all in on this study. Uh, it was either gonna prove that lawyers matter or it was gonna mean that much of what I had bothered working on for my career was wasted. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to report, as Tim will make clear, um, we won that bet. Um, the multi-year study that Tim is gonna describe evaluated whether the kind of legal representation provided to parents can actually make a difference in case outcomes. Uh, it's the largest study um, of its kind ever conducted. Most importantly, it compared case outcomes based on whether parents were represented by solo practitioners who uh, were experienced lawyers appointed to the assigned counsel panel in New York City. Um, or by professionals who are part of a multidisciplinary law office that includes lawyers, social workers, and parent advocates. After many years of lobbying New York City officials to change the attorney representation model, uh, we were successful in 2007 to uh, reach the point where New York City awarded for the first time to three multidisciplinary law offices, including Kara Fink's, uh, to handle at least 50% of all child welfare filings in family court. Uh, those three offices, the Bronx Defenders, Kara's original home, the Brooklyn Defenders, um, and the Center for Family Representation were each awarded multi-year contracts for this work in their respective counties, three counties in New York City. Since then, um, the uh, experiment has rolled out much beyond. But the purpose of the study was to determine whether the kind of legal representation given uh, made any difference. Uh, and I wanna make clear especially for those of you in um, uh, diverse parts of the country, that the comparison group, the solo practitioners, uh, constitute um, what would be characterized before we came into existence as maybe the best kind of uh, legal representation uh, parents could get. Uh, they had to be experienced, 
They had to apply for and be approved to join the panel. And they were paid an hourly rate of $75 an hour with an unlimited cap. So we are really talking about whether a kind of legal representation offered in New York City, which is itself far better than is offered in much of this country, even through this day, was good enough. And what we discovered, it wasn't nearly good enough. What we discovered was something I had long believed, um, but which we never could prove until now, which is that an astonishing number of children are needlessly separated from their families for no better reason than that we have failed to give parents the kind of representation that could result in children being raised safely at home. Um, the details of our study, the key findings, the, the protocol of it, um, I now turn over to my uh, good friend and um, scientist expert, uh, Tim Ross. Thank you, Marty. Let me uh, share my screen for a second. All right. All right, so uh, Noeshi, please let me know if the sharing is uh, going appropriately. Um, uh, really excited to be here today and happy to present uh, the, our study on the effects of an interdisciplinary approach to parent representation in child welfare. Uh, I will give you a summary of the work we did. Uh, this study took nearly three years uh, and it, we'll try to get through it in 15 minutes. Uh, there, uh, you will get a copy of this presentation sent to you in a follow-up email. And there are two articles uh, that came out of the study. Uh, you can find links to those articles on the Action Research website or uh, just Googling it, it'll come up. Okay. Uh, first wanna um, uh, acknowledge the project team who did uh, the bulk of the work. Uh, Luke Gerber, uh, Dr. Erica Pang, uh, Jana Majewski, uh, uh, Joel Miller, and we had really great partnerships uh, with uh, Casey Family Programs and Peter Pecora, uh, and of course, Marty and uh, Sue Jacobs, who served as our project administrator. We also had an advisory board to give us uh, uh, advice and to share their knowledge. Uh, folks at Casey Family Programs, uh, one of the panel attorneys, uh, a former uh, family court judge in New York City, one of the provider agencies, uh, a representative from the New York City Administration for Children's Services, and Mark Testa at the University of North Carolina, uh, who was really helpful on the methodology for the work we did. Um, so the American Bar Association, the Children's Bureau, and other stakeholders endorse an interdisciplinary team approach to parental representation that includes out-of-court engagement and it pairs attorneys with social workers. In most jurisdictions, however, parents either have no counsel until late in the process or are assigned a solo practitioner without social work support. Few jurisdictions utilize an interdisciplinary case practice approach. Uh, until recently, there was only real one uh, methodologically a sophisticated study of parental representation that was done by Mark Courtney and his colleague uh, in 2012 that looked at permanency outcomes uh, by the representation uh, that parents received. So we set out um, to figure out how children's outcomes differ when their parents are represented by interdisciplinary law offices, which I'm gonna call ILOs, uh, compared to panel attorneys. And we drew on um, uh, an evaluable, evaluable, evaluability study uh, done by uh, Mark Testa and Mark Courtney in 2012, which really helped, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, really helped uh, 
uh, guide our work. So Noeshi, I'm not sure what screen we're on now. Are we on the advisory board screen or are we on um, the summary of model differences? I'm gonna assume we're on the summary of model differences. Uh, so Marty- We're, we're up, on the advisory board. Oh, okay. We should be uh, further along then. Ah, there we go. Good. Thank you. Uh, Marty summed up um, many of the differences in the two models that we examined. Uh, the Interdisciplinary Law Office, the ILO, is a nonprofit law office that includes shared resources, supervision, administrative support, and professional development opportunities. Uh, the interdisciplinary case practice model has social workers and other experts as team members, often parent advocates. Uh, and they were awarded contracts from New York City government and fee was paid uh, to the providers uh, per case and they had salaried staff. The panel attorneys uh, in contrast were solo practitioners, uh, had their own private practices. They had the option of petitioning the court for other experts, including social workers. Uh, and they had to be certified uh, uh, by the panel uh, that Marty mentioned as qualified uh, to practice in family court. They were paid per hour, uh, in theory up to a maximum per case, but in, in practice that max, maximum was rarely if ever applied. So this study was groundbreaking for a couple of reasons. Uh, this is the largest study of parent representation uh, in family court, tracing the outcomes of almost 10,000 families and almost 20,000 uh, children through a four-year follow-up period. Uh, the study makes the strongest possible assessment short of an experimental design uh, of the causal impact of parental representation using administrative data. We found uh, in our key findings that the ILO representation reduced children's time in foster care by nearly four months during the 48 months following the filing of the petition. Uh, this occurred primarily through faster early reunification outcomes as compared to panel representation. And as I'll discuss a little bit further on, uh, this amounts to uh, up to nearly $40 million in annual savings in foster board rates uh, for New York City. Importantly, we found that children were just as safe with ILL representation uh, as they were with panel attorneys. So the fact that children went home uh, more quickly from foster care did not result in uh, a higher rate of subsequent maltreatment. Uh, we did not find that ILO representation prevented foster care entry uh, following the petition. Um, this was a finding, I just wanna uh, note uh, that our uh, colleagues uh, in the ILOs in New York City uh, would contest uh, around the data that we used for that particular part of the study. So how did we design the study? Uh, the population that we examined were families uh, that had a petition filed against them in New York City Family Court. These were single respondent cases and they were first filings only. Uh, we looked at either the intervention, the interdisciplinary law office, uh, or the control group uh, where the parents were represented by a panel attorney. Our outcome measures uh, were child safety, uh, uh, were children safe and stable uh, when they got home and how quickly they got there. The data we used were provided uh, by a couple primary sources. Uh, the first was the uh, data from the New York City Administration for Children's Services which provided us uh, information on both the petitions and the length of time in foster care. Uh, this research was approved not only by uh, ACS, but also by the New York State Office of Children and Family Services, a private IRB uh, and Casey Family Programs. So the data were very much protected. Uh, another source of data that we used were the attorney panel, uh, attorney name rosters. And we got these both from the first and second department 
uh, in New York City, which manages and administrates the panel attorney program, and from the ILO providers uh, themselves, uh, and wanted to thank them for uh, their help in that matter. Uh, we use the names on those attorney rosters uh, to match the data that ACS provided to figure out which families were represented by an ILO attorney and which families were represented by a panel attorney. We were able to do uh, name matches to 97% of the cases we looked at. Uh, so we're pretty confident that we got the universe of what we wanted to find. We looked at families uh, with child abuse and neglect petitions that were filed uh, between 2007 and 2014. Uh, we ended at 2014 because we wanted a four year follow up period. And we started in 2007, as Marty mentioned, that's when the ILOs first received contracts from New York City. And we had a really unique situation because the contracts that the ILOs received in the different boroughs did not cover all of the cases. Uh, they covered in some cases, the ILO uh, would cover uh, certain days of the week. So we had something uh, that was close to uh, and akin to a natural experiment where cases were assigned to one, uh, either the control group or the intervention group. We limited uh, the group that we looked at uh, to each family's first petition. So we didn't wanna look at second petitions because then you would get a lot of uh, uh, effects from the first experience in court that we thought would be really hard to control for. Uh, we also only looked at single uh, respondent cases. So where there were dual respondent cases, sometimes you would have an ILO on one side and, and a solo practitioner on the other, uh, which would muddy the waters. We tried as much as we could to compare uh, apples to apples. And after we narrowed uh, our, our population down, this left us with approximately 10,000 families. We used a method called propensity score matching. Uh, and in propensity score matching, what you try to do is you look at your intervention group and you try to find a group that looks as similar as possible uh, that did not receive the intervention so that you can isolate the impact of the intervention itself. This is a list of the matching criteria that we used. And the matching criteria really determine the strength of this technique. You wanna have as many criteria that could possibly explain outcomes uh, as you can find. So the kinds of uh, criteria that we had access to and were able to use were the petition filing year, uh, which court borough was filed in, in uh, one of New York City's five boroughs, uh, the judge that heard the case, the allegations in the petition, uh, and the parent's number of substantiations uh, pre-filing. We also were able to look at a lot of the parent characteristics, including whether the parent had been in foster care as a child, how long they were in foster care, whether they were in foster care at the time of the filing of the petition, uh, as well as parents' demographics, including uh, age, sex, race, and ethnicity. Uh, on the child side, we con uh, controlled for things like the number of children uh, on the petition, uh, whether they were in care at filing or not, uh, age and other demographics. A second method that we use is called competing risk models. And this statistical technique allows us to estimate the effect of the type of representation and how often event, in this case, types of permanency, uh, will occur over time. Uh, holding a set of other factors equal. Uh, so it is a type of multivariate modeling uh, that can be very helpful in this kind of situation. So first I wanna talk about the findings regarding permanency. Uh, when an ILO represented the parent as compared to a, a panel attorney, children who entered foster care achieved permanency 34% uh, more often in the first year. 25% more often in the second year, 17% more often in the third year, and 9% more often in the fourth year. And this was primarily due to early reunification uh, so that the child went home uh, quickly, particularly in the first year. We also wanted to look at the fiscal implications of our findings. 
Uh, so we used the propensity score match sample, and we wanted to look at how many days in foster care uh, from the time of petition filing through the next four years children spent in foster care. So these are res the results. On average, in families where the uh, ILO was represented, uh, represented the parent, there was a savings of four months uh, or 118 days of foster care per child who entered care from the time of the petition through that four year period. So then we wanted to figure out like what that really means in terms of dollars and cents. Uh, and so over the past several years, New York City has had about 4,000 foster care entries uh, a year. And if you had a hypothetical situation uh, where you could compare what would happen to them if all of those uh, children were in families represented, were represented by ILOs, or if they instead they had been represented by panel attorneys, what would the difference be? So we would figure that that would be 4,000 children that would stay 118 days each less in foster care, which adds up to 472 thousand bed days per year. New York City's entire foster care system in 2016 used 3.8 million uh, bed days in the year. So the bed days saved by this intervention alone were estimated to be about 12% of New York City's total foster care bed days in a particular year. If you multiply that by the board rate that New York City pays uh, foster care providers, our system is all contracted out, uh, that comes out to about $40 million in annual savings in foster care costs. So in sum, uh, we found that the interdisciplinary parental representation model furthers the goals of child well-being, safety, and permanency. Uh, the interdisciplinary uh, model safely de decreases the use of foster care, it increased permanency outcomes for children, and uh, saved the government millions of dollars. There are uh, some policy opportunities uh, to take advantage of. These are a little dated. Uh, we finished our study, as Marty mentioned, in 2019, and I'm sure there have been other developments some of you may know uh, that I don't. Uh, in 2018, uh, as we were finishing this study up, the Children's Bureau amended the Child Welfare Policy Manual, uh, allowing Title IV -E agencies to claim administrative costs for providing legal representation, including ILO representation, to parents and children in child welfare cases. Uh, the Family First Prevention Services Act in 2018 uh, authorized federal financing for uh, evidence-based programs that keep uh, children out of foster care, we are hopeful that perhaps uh, ILOs can be qualified as one of those programs. Uh, there, this is, a, as I mentioned, a fairly brief summary of the work we did. Uh, when you receive uh, your copy of this presentation, uh, there'll be lots of uh, ways that you can access it. You can write uh, to Marty, to our project administrator, Sue Jacobs, uh, to myself, or to Peter Pecora at uh, Casey Family Programs. I'm sure all of us would be happy to speak with you. Uh, so uh, with that, I am gonna turn it over to, uh, to Cara Fink. Uh, Thank you so much, Tim. And as we sort of switch, uh, switch slides and move on to our, our next presenters, um, we are going to again have time and there are already some great questions coming into the Q&A, so please continue to put your questions about the study's design, the work that Marty and Tim and their team have been doing in New York City, um, since we will have time to, to cover those after our next three presenters who I'm thrilled are joining us today. And we'll hopefully give everyone in the webinar a sense of what this means in practice, because we can talk about the outcomes of the study, which are phenomenal. Um, but what I think is gonna be helpful in thinking about how we expand interdisciplinary legal uh, representation across the country and truly improve outcomes for families is to understand how this works. And so I'm thrilled to have Kathleen Kramer, April Lee, and Maggie Potter joining us from the Community Legal Services Family Advocacy Unit, 
I am going to quickly introduce them because I want you to hear from them and the work that they do. Um, Kathleen Kramer is the managing attorney of the Family Advocacy Unit at Community Legal Services, which she joined in 2006 as a staff attorney and where she leads a holistic family defense model helping parents involved in the child welfare system. She is active in national and statewide reform efforts as part of the ABA's National Alliance for Parent Representation, the Family Justice Initiative, and the Pennsylvania Statewide Children's Roundtable. As a former Stonely Foundation fellow who focused on improving reunification outcomes for children of incarcerated parents, Kathleen has been a leader on the national, local, and state stage for years, and I'm thrilled that she's talking about her work today with us. April Lee has the honor and distinction of being Community Legal Services' first peer parent advocate in the Family Advocacy Unit, but more importantly, the first person in this role of any kind in legal services in Pennsylvania. April supports the legal team by drawing on her lived experience in the system and her unwavering commitment to serve families. She sits on several boards in Philadelphia, including the Children's Coalition with PHMC, and has also helped guide research surrounding the opioid epidemic as part of the City of Philadelphia's Don't Take the Risk Awareness Campaign. She is also an accomplished poet, and I also found out accomplished painter um, who performs frequently across Philadelphia. Maggie Potter is a social worker in the Family Advocacy Unit at Community Legal Services, where she has worked since 2012. She has not only published reports on kinship care, but has also spoken widely about the impact of trauma on families in the child welfare system, and she routinely and regularly trains on trauma-informed lawyering. Previously, she worked as a policy advocate and membership services specialist at the Pennsylvania Council of Children, Youth, and Family Services. And with that, I hand it over to our distinguished panelists to talk about the work. Hi, everyone. Um, I am so excited to be here um, talking about one of my favorite subjects with some of my favorite people. Um, I think if, if any of you um, have had some experience in child welfare, you've seen the phenomenon of the shiny object, the shiny new object in child welfare, the new interventions, the new way of collecting data or studying things. Um, that folks believe is going to make a difference in the lives of children and families. And as an advocate, again and again, I've been disappointed by those shiny new objects because they ha they fail to deliver for my clients. Um, I'm here to tell you, family defense is one of those shiny objects that actually delivers. So you saw that in the research um, that Tim presented, and I hope you're going to hear about it through the work that you can, we're going to talk about that April and Maggie do every day. Just to give you a little bit of context for who we are, uh, we work at Community Legal Services, which is the largest civil legal aid provider in the city. Um, and I manage the Family Advocacy Unit, which is actually a rather small, holistic family defense practice. We've had a holistic model for decades, um, but we only have had a peer advocate for a year, and that has really just stepped our practice up to the next level. Um, we are similar um, to where New York was. 10 or 15 years ago in that we only represent a small fraction of the parents in Philadelphia. Most parents are receiving that kind of panel attorney model in the city of Philadelphia. Um, our work is guided by the understanding that if you want to help a child, uh, the most important thing you can do is to help her mom or dad. And we provide very intensive wraparound support and our support works. So we um, have not had the kind of comprehensive study that New York benefited from, but we started looking at some of our data a few years back, and we found that families who have the benefit of our legal representation see much better outcomes for their children. So our average time to reunification for families is 4.4 months in a city that, um, where most children reunify in around nine months. Um, if children have to be separated from their families, which we try to avoid at all costs due to what we know about the trauma of family separation, we're very good at helping children find temporary homes with family. So um, of children on FAU, the Family Advocacy Unit's caseloads who are separated from their mom and dad, who are placed in a family-like home, 77% of those kids are with a kinship resource, somebody they already know and love. And that's compared to an average in the city of Philadelphia um, of 56%. So those are just some of the statistics about our work, but I actually really wanna dig in 
to what the work looks like. Um, and I really want to start with April because April brings such a unique perspective to this work because she herself survived the system as a mom um, of, of kids who were separated from her and uh, survived the child welfare system and is now bringing her talents and her wisdom and her expertise to help our moms. And so, April, I want to just open it up with a question for you. Um, I've heard you say multiple times, uh, no parent in the child welfare system should have just a lawyer. Yet you yourself, when you went through the child welfare system, had just a lawyer. How does your own experience as a mother and as an advocate lead you to that conclusion that no parent should have just a lawyer? Absolutely. Thanks, Kathleen. Like to this day, I cannot tell you who my lawyer was, whether or not it was a woman, man, what, to this day. And to give you the background on that, when my children got removed from my home, I kind of went into a downward spiral. Um, got really worse with the drugs. I kind of put my hands up and just gave up. Like them not understanding that my children at that time was my identity in totality, right? Um, a year before my children were removed, I was raped and went six months without wanting to leave my house. So like all these different things going on internally um, with me and within that case. So by the time it got to that point, the, the, the very last thing that I had as a human being to hold on to at that time that was good, that was that was right, that was worth living for was taken from. Me. So in turn, I just like jumped off the ledge, right? Just completely jumped off the ledge. So I, I, I sit back and I think a lot like, what would happen if I had Kathleen or Maggie or myself on my case, my personal case, right? And watching them and what we do, I understand that value of really connecting with that parent and understanding no one wakes up and say, hey, I want to be a drug addict. No one wakes up and say, hey, today is a good day to have my children removed, right? There's always a reason for me um, behind that. And in my case, going through that, the, the DHS, well, the city investigator that was investing my case, she never said, well, let's look at April's history. April was a youth ministry leader, highly involved in all the children's schools, like all these different things going on. I, I loved community. Like I would have scavenger hunts, pick up kids throughout the neighborhood just to do something with them. So that wasn't looked at. Well, what was looked at is, look at this junky mother, we got to protect these children, um, honestly. And I just, I, I, I truly do think about that. Like, what if I had Maggie on my case? And Maggie understanding the trauma that's attached to something as traumatic as a physical rape, right? And understanding that trauma and say, hey, well, let's go out and reach out. Within my role, I see parents right where they are, you know, with no judgment. I'm not going to judge you and say, look, you're doing A, B, and C. You need to get better with A, B, and C. No, I'm going to try to connect them with those resources and figure out the solution to the problem. So a lot of times within a case, we point out parents' issues, their, their problems, and never say, well, maybe we can connect them with something that has solved this issue in this case don't have to be dragged on forever or maybe we can help them with some basic things that we don't have to spend this huge amount of money of keeping them here right and i know for a fact just by the team that we have best unit ever which i say often <laughs> um we really and i know myself go above and beyond when it comes down to trying to figure out what a parent needs not only that, how did you get here? This is, is, is of no importance that we're here. We know we're here, right? We're no we in court. We know this parent is in care, so to speak. How can we help? How can we serve you? What is the solution to keep this family together? 
not find reasons to keep our families apart. Mm. Thank you, April. I think um, you, one thing you highlighted that I just want to flag is the non-judgmental attitude that we bring to every client. Um, we, it's a, we are a system, the child welfare system is a very deficit focused system. Our clients are shamed constantly for their failings. And believe me, they're aware of their failings. We're not here to continue to beat them over the head with their feelings. We're here to help them get to solutions. Um, and I want to turn to Maggie and ask her, because Maggie um, brings a really unique skill set to this work. Uh, you've been a social worker in the Family Advocacy Unit for eight years now. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is the social worker's role in a family defense team? Sure. Um, thank you, April. Thank you, Kathleen. And thanks to the Field Center for having us. I'm so excited to be here to talk about our um, you know, model of interdisciplinary work that uh, April already talked a little bit about, but as a social worker on the team, I'm bringing kind of a unique and different uh, set of skills and kind of training and background. Um, social workers have a lot of, we come to things with a person and environment perspective, looking at the kind of picture of what are that person's supports, what is their history. We bring a strengths-based perspective, so really as opposed to that deficit model that Kathleen was talking about, we look at, and, and what April mentioned, like what what is this parent doing right and what, how can we build on that and um, rather than shaming or blaming. Um, we have a lot of experience and, and training around trauma and around skills to, to support folks who are going through a trauma um, or who have a tra like an understanding that parents have their own trauma histories that they're bringing to the table and how that might impact the way that they are able to cope in that moment when some when the system comes in and removes their children. That can be triggering. We can help them achieve a different sort of, um, you know, brain state with, with the fact that they may be um, having an elevated sense of crisis and, and not be able to think and plan and respond in like a linear fashion. Um, we have skills around active listening and, and motivational interviewing to help clients identify their own um, barriers and, and their own motivations to get um, to, the, to the goals that are set and to set their own goals. Um, the folks in my office sometimes talk about how social workers sort of speak the language that of the system. We have some more similar background and training to the folks who are in the case management roles. And so we can sometimes negotiate differently or speak differently or connect differently with the case manager from the CUIT, from the community umbrella agency or case management agency um, or the investigator. We can, um, we have a, a knowledge about sort of resources and an understanding of how to make referrals and how to do that warm handoff. So amongst the group of us in our office, we have a lot, a huge wealth of knowledge of different programs that are really um, trauma informed and, and responsive to our clients and are, are gonna meet them where they're at. And we can kind of do that warm handoff. Um, we have more time because we're not in court uh, as much. So we, we can do the court accompaniment piece, but we can also go to team meetings or do a home visit or sit with that client through a doctor's appointment or a, you know, a. Um, ancillary kind of court appointment, um, we can we can get to know that client and build that trust and use those active listening skills and those um, meet, meet them where they're at skills to, to kind of build that relationship that will help the whole team serve the client better. Um, yeah, I think those are most of the things that I wanted to say about the skills of the social worker. And, and many of the folks in my office have these skills as well, but I think we as social workers are all, also able to kind of inform the, the other folks in our unit if we have an understanding of a case that may be unique or different and to help them kind of gain those skills as well. We do a lot of trainings around trauma for the staff at CLS as well as for other outside folks. Yeah, and as a lawyer doing this work, I, I have been fortunate to always have a social worker around me doing it and I really can't imagine doing it without the support of a social worker. Um, it's so much better for my clients, and it's also made me such a better lawyer because I've built some skills around client engagement and understanding trauma that I never would have had the opportunity to build if I wasn't seeing Maggie in the office every day. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the concrete. What does this look like for clients? Um, I can tell you from the lawyer's perspective, what this looks like for clients is our clients receive excellent legal representation. Our lawyers are experts on the law. Our lawyers are strategic, they're hardworking, they file motions, they file appeals, 
You guys, we just won a published Supreme Court, a Superior Court case today. Check it out. Um, so our lawyers are tenacious, zealous advocates. Um, but I, and, and you might see that in the courtroom, but I think what some folks don't necessarily understand about family defense is all the work that happens outside of the courtroom. And so April or Maggie, whoever wants to start, could you talk a little bit about what does this look like for clients? Can you talk about what are you doing for clients to help them? So Maggie, you want me to take it first? <laughs> all right. Um, First and foremost, going back to that trauma piece within my, my case, it's very easy for a parent to get discouraged or to fall into despair and like this grip of hopelessness when you have to jump through all these different hurdles to get what you feel as though is your right. You know, my children are my right. Like I birthed these children and you, you have little say so and so much within your case. So I work very closely with my parents and outside of my case load, um, just to help parents really overcome that. Right? I understand that pain that's connected to that. I understand that feeling of hopelessness. I understand crying at night, missing your children. I understand like writing letters that never made it to my kids. Right, and in, in that sense, in order to motivate a parent to continue on this journey, which is very traumatic, is very like disheartening and unimaginably painful. Um, sometimes like, I serve as that vision of hope, so to speak. You know, I can tell them like, yeah, the system sucks, right? <laughs> yeah, this is not okay. Um, this is not okay. And I can clearly see and put together those connections and those resources to actually make it easier um, to reunify this family. So I spent a lot of my time like in that resource mode. I give parents the opportunity, call me, which a lot of them take, you know, take me up on that offer. And I'm on the phone eight o'clock at night, if that means helping a parent move forward in their case and not to give up or not to just throw in a towel. Cause it's easy to see that you're like fighting as a parent. I'm talking as a parent. Um, you're, you're, you're like fighting multiple parties. You're fighting like multiple people. You're doing all these things. And sometimes you feel like is for no reason or you're not making leeway or you're not getting through or you're not being successful. And I reassure them that small progress is still progress. Like, let's just keep going. How can I help? What can I do? I've, throughout this pandemic, I've sat on people's stoops. You know, I, I've picked up and dropped off clients. I, you know, I'm really hands on just because I understand that, that, that despair and uh, I like live in empathy when it comes down to my clients. You know, I have a, client that went through a food insecurity, um, just reunified, and her cabinets was low, right? So the agency worker is like, oh my gosh, she don't have no food. Let's call the child advocate. Let's call the city solicitor. Let's do all these things. And I'm like, hold on, wait, pause. Like I can go to the market right now to drop client off some food instead of us trying to figure out how to bring up this issue in court when she just reunified with her children, right? So we, we build those resources and those connections to not have everything blown out of proportion and just really figure out the solution to the problem at hand. Yeah, I would agree with just echoing a lot of what April said about being that person who is a listening ear and there when someone needs to vent or needs to cry or express frustration or um, brainstorm. Um, I'm a really big fan of affirmations. I think as April and Kathleen both alluded to, like the system really can beat people down and make them feel, you know, they probably already were in crisis. They probably have a trauma history and now they're being told that they're a bad parent by a lot of the different sort of situations that they're in in the courtroom. and the meetings about all of the things that they're not in compliance with or that they're failing. 
um, to do. And so being that person who builds them up and who, you know, sees what they're, how hard they're working, how much they're trying, how, how many things they've, you know, put effort into already, how much they love their child, um, that, that role of kind of building someone up and affirming the, the work that they're doing and the strengths that they have. Um, but just for like a few kind of concrete examples, another thing I think that we do a lot and that we're lucky to have at CLS is the sort of issue spotting and recognizing when other units that are, we have eight different legal units at CLS, I think, or maybe nine, um, including things like evictions and public benefits and um, utility shutoffs. And so our, I think sometimes my role as a social worker is kind of being able to see like a little bit of a bigger picture and remember that beyond the legal strategy of our, of our um, family court case, there's also the, the fact that this client might, and, and all of these things benefit the, <laughs> the family court case, but, but recognizing if maybe they should have, they were, you know, denied FSI benefits or they're at risk of eviction or they have a utility shut off, we can kind of make an internal referral. And so, you know, I've had clients where I, um, for example, had a client who had a lot of medical issues, was definitely, um, having a sort of uh, depression and was struggling to get to treatment and was struggling with her medications and recognizing that she had been denied SSI and connecting her, going out to do a home visit, sitting with her to do the paperwork, um, helping her get connected to those treatment um, places so that she could appeal her SSI and win um, a, a, an increased income that would help kind of stabilize her life in other ways. Um, that was one example that came to mind. I also had a deaf client who, it was clear to me she had a number of different um, legal problems. And so I arranged a meeting with a number of attorneys from our office, a ASL interpreter, um, you know, a bunch of her, had her bring all of her paperwork in. And we kind of just sat together in one of our big conference rooms. This was years ago um, before COVID, but we sat down and kind of went through everything. Maybe she had something with her children's SSI. Maybe she had an employment issue. We, we went through all of it and had that interpreter there. And we did, you know, the big picture stuff that helped get some of those other burdens off of her plate. Um, I had a client who was in a domestic violence situation and she, uh, with the father on the case and she you know was able through the support of myself and the lawyer and her caseworker from the agency um to leave the, the situation and you know try to find new housing but she also had to file um charges against him in court and so i accompanied her to that hearing to be able to sit with her in the courtroom and to be able to be there you know if she needed to kind of speak or face off um, with him or hear what was going to happen and I think that that meant a lot to her to have us show up um, in places where you know she might have been on her own I know other advocates go to team meetings for edu special education or for um, other kind of meetings that aren't necessarily our meetings to go to but that we can be that that support person and help kind of advance um, the overall well-being of that family. So Dorothy Roberts at Penn Law has said that um, the child welfare system is a misnomer, that the system is more appropriately called the family regulation system because um, of its uh, function of surveilling and controlling poor families and particularly poor families of color. And one thing that I, I hope comes out, but I think is really important to make explicit is um, we are fully divested from surveillance and control of our clients um, because we are not mandated reporters. So our clients who are in crisis have a safe place when they walk into our office to tell us about their crisis and we'll help them resolve it. So if a mom is, as April was saying, experiencing food insecurity, she can come to us. We're not gonna call DHS on her. We're just gonna help her get some food for her kids. Um, and that becomes a really important aspect of our model. Clients have a right to confidentiality. They have a right to loyalty. And that helps us get to the kind of outcomes that serve parents and children the best. Um, I wanna move on to one last question. There's been a growing understanding of the racial injustice embedded in the child welfare system with Dorothy Roberts at Penn being a leading scholar in that work. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about the role of family defense in that picture? I was listening to a podcast last week that had Marty Guggenheim on it. And he was talking about 
his circle of his relationship of his friends, his community, and that he knew no one um, within that circle that had firsthand experience of the foster care system or has been involved in, you know, one way or the other. And when he made these comments, I was kind of like blown back, right? Because I had to like really stop and ponder on it. And I'm like, in my community, I virtually know no one who haven't been involved, right? Um, I I'm, I'm, have a huge family. I have 10 siblings, eight living. Out of the eight living, five have children. Out of the five who have children, three of them have been involved in the foster care system and the child welfare system. So it's like, it's, it's a regular um, occurrence where I'm from. And what he pointed out in his podcast is that he is from a higher class um, living. And no surprise, right? I've come from a very poverty-stricken community. I come from, you know, almost no income um, at, at all. Like I understand I have I have lived on minimum wage, taking care of three children, providing a home, food, and all these different things. So we're not handling or looking at once again the societal issue or where that person is from. This this is the lump sidedness of the child welfare system, right? Um, if you don't know what it is to live on seven dollars and twenty five cent and maintain a house maintain a job, maintain food, maintain all these different things that we are held to the standard of as parents, right? And to be pointed out like, well, listen, you're transient, which I will be considered transient um, up until recently. Um, you can't maintain stable housing. You're living with family members. You're like jumping around or whatever like that, not understanding that I couldn't afford to stay stable, so to speak, as far as what they wanted of me. So I see that on a regular basis, if you're talking about 30% of children in foster care right now can go home due to housing, it's an issue. So it's not, you know, it's, for me, would these same questions be asked or would this standard be there if we were talking about a higher class white community? Would we be surveilling them or do we surveil them as much as we do within our zip code or within my community? I can clearly say, you know, almost every person I know have been affected one way or the other um, within my community. So that should show you the disparity of, of race. I'm not talking about data. I'm talking about what I live day to day, my actual family, my actual friends, because of the projects that I was born into. So how can, how are we in this day and time still holding people accountable because they was born into poverty or they were born poor or born into the wrong zip code? Just, you know, my opinion. I know we're running long time, but if I could just add, um, yeah, <laughs> April already said it all, but anyway, the, I think it's super important to talk about, um, parent defense as a racial justice issue. And here in Philadelphia, our population is approximately 45 to 50% black or African-American and the population of children in foster care is between 65 and 70% black. So it's clear that there's an over-representation, um, a racial disproportionality and, I think that one of the things that we neglect to think about is, or, or that we don't think about as much in this system is the trauma of separating children from their parents and how traumatic it is for a child to be taken, especially if they're not going into a kinship home, but in general to have their, you know, their lives upended like that is incredibly traumatic. Um, studies have borne out that it is more traumatic in the long term if they could have potentially been able to stay at home to be removed is, is a more traumatic intervention. Um, and I think that that is really connected back again to something that Dorothy Roberts talks about, and she's been 
huge shout out to Dorothy Roberts, but hugely influential to all of us. But like the devaluation of the bonds between black mothers and their children is a societal problem that we've had in this country since the founding of this country and goes back to the um, history of slavery and, and of separating mothers and children. Um, and so I think that we, we see that playing out still in the devaluation of the bonds and attachment and the trauma of separating black families and, and that we need to think about the biases that are playing out um, in that system. Thank you guys. I want to open it up for larger conversations. I'm going to turn it over to Kara at this point. Thank you so much, April, Maggie, and Kathleen. That was so incredibly powerful and informative and I think really um, shed such a light on, on the possibilities, really the infinite possibilities to improve this system for children and families through your model. Uh, we have, not surprisingly, a ton of questions. I'm going to ask Marty and Tim to, to join us as well. Um, and, and I want to start with some of the questions that folks might be able to see as well have been answered uh, in written format in the Q&A. Please continue to, to raise questions if you have them. But I wanted to start off by asking um, for perhaps the CLS group, uh, for jurisdictions that don't have the benefit of your model, and I think this question came up in, in a number um, of responses from, from attendees, what can be done? Are there any new opportunities perhaps to access federal funding for parent representation? And what are some of the sort of barriers to getting models like yours in place um, to help a wider range of parents and families? I'll take that one. Um... I, because I think about this all the time because I, I just like April says, I totally believe no parent should just have a lawyer. Um, and we know most parents in the child welfare system in America just have a lawyer. Um, so um, I know I sound like a car salesman, but I want to say to you, not only is doing this work the humane and just thing to do, not only does it get to the best outcomes for kids and parents, not only does it lead to cost savings in terms of foster care costs for kids, um, it is also today available to you at a steep 50% discount because the federal government has announced that it will reimburse states and counties that invest in this model at a 50% rate. Now they made that announcement about two years ago but right at the beginning of the pandemic, and I worry that people may have missed this, they made a second, even better announcement. And that announcement is not only are they going to reimburse for the cost of legal rep um, by attorneys, they're also going to reimburse for the cost of interdisciplinary teams, including peer advocates, social workers, paralegals, and administrative costs to run an ILO. So there's no better time to invest in this model. Um, and honestly, I wonder all the time, why isn't everybody doing this? Because um, it is a cost saving. Um, it's a tremendous cost savings. I would love to talk a little more about the cost savings that we perhaps weren't able to capture in the New York study, because it's not just bed days that we're saving. We're saving court costs. We're saving caseworker time. We're saving attorney time. We're, sa we're, sa we're saving overhead at, at these foster care agencies. Like, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that is captured in the 40 million in New York alone per year. Zero. And Tim's saying nothing. Okay, so the cost savings are epic and it works. And so I actually have the same question for the audience. If you live in a place that doesn't have this, why don't you? Um, but one thing I will say is if you're struggling uh, the Family Justice Initiative uh, is, an, is a national project that's funded by the KC Family Program that has done a lot of work to educate and inform people about this model and educate and inform them about how they can start drawing down that Title IV-E reimbursement. Um, because there, you know, there, are, there are needs for sample MOUs. You can find sample MOUs on the website. Um, if you want to see how other states or counties are implementing it, Lots of folks are trying different ways of implementation. You can learn about them on the website. It's familyjusticeinitiative.org if you're looking to get started. 
And Tim and Marty, could you perhaps speak to Kathleen's point that there may be a whole host of costs that weren't captured in the study and then perhaps expand on from your perspective, now that the study is out in the world, what do you want to see jurisdictions doing to help implement really the results of the study? And, and what has been the reaction um, in other counties other than, than New York? So Marty, why don't, why don't I take the, the cost benefit piece first and I'll be quick on that. When we were, when we were doing uh, the study, we wanted to be as conservative as possible. We didn't want anyone to, to look at the work and say, well, you know, you overestimated this, or you overestimated that. So we took the one cost that we knew definitely we could tie in with the uh, savings and days, and that was the foster care board rate. But you're right, there's all sorts of other costs that are saved as well that are not counted in that $40 million. Yeah, no, there is no question about that. Um, Tim alluded to one feature of the study's findings that the advocates would contest if we had a trial. And that was whether uh, they succeed in preventing removals from the start. Uh, whatever the answer was from the study, we, we know that all of the defender offices in New York have spread out to become involved in pre-removal interventions. And we can't count how many times we've prevented those interventions. Um, but it turns out I just published an article, which is the third part of this study in the Family Law Quarterly that tells the story of how common it is to prevent a removal uh, full scale. But in addition to that, we've become a political force in New York City. The foster care population has driven down from 24,000 to under 7,000. That's not only because of the family defender community, but the family defender community is part of that uh, uh, explanation. We meet with the commissioner regularly. We complain regularly. We say, you need a policy to address this. And then we say, your policy isn't being implemented. And then we say, either you mean it or you don't. We put enormous pressure. Um, and the absence of that pressure means um, that agencies get to do whatever they want uh, all the time. In April and Maggie, a question that came up in the, the, uh, from the attendees that I thought you might want to address is, First of all, talking a little bit about what Marty just mentioned and that that pre petition work right the work that you do to support a family from ever having a child go into foster care in the first place, which I think for many is probably still a revolutionary concept of a lawyer getting involved before there's even a family court case. Could you describe a little bit about the work you do there and why you think it's so critical. Um, I just had a case recently that I took on is end up closing it now um, that was preventative um, where the lawyer pretty much didn't even have to touch it. <laughs> um, I negotiated with the city's agency. They, they kind of wanted mom to sign um, like this cookie cutter safety plan that like was doomed to fail from the beginning, um, as far as the amount of things, they're like, mom is stressed out, so we're going to throw a bunch of stuff at her and tell her to do A, B, and C, and maybe this will help with her stress, right? And I'm like, well, that's more stress that you're at, and um, <laughs> this parent, and we're trying to, you know, get it to the point where there's no reason to take it to court. So if mom is highly stressed out, as you say, um, do you really think that adding five other things for her to do in the course of a week will ease that stress or would this be problematic, you know, and after having this conversation back and forth, they realize like, oh yeah, you're right. I understand. So let's try to figure this out. And it was like really closed out where mom was able to just get a break, a two hour break throughout the week. If mom is feeling stressed or is, you know, having a rough day, we have someone who can step in and say, hey, take kids for a couple hours, let me go get a breather. 
Um, and that rectified the situation without have without it having to be taken to court. Now, I and the whole time I'm like doing this um, back and forth in mediation. And they're like, but you only supposed to work in on cases that's in court. Like, no, April. Um, we're not going to court though. Like, why are you on this phone? Why are you making all these different phone calls? And I explained to them like I so it won't get to court. So it won't get to this point to where this family have to be separated and like dragged through the mud when mom just needs a two hour breather sometimes as most parents do. Like my kids are homeschooled now too. And I need a breather sometimes. You know, I can call my sister and say, hey, come babysit. I'm going to go get my nails done and I'm going to go, you, you know, relax. And this mom didn't necessarily have that planned out. So something as basic as a babysitter for two hours stopped a petition from coming into court. Add to what April already really clearly uh, explained that we have a hotline that we run from nine to five Monday through Friday. And so we it's actually a great time to call us if you haven't gone to a family court yet, because we can potentially start working with that family before it gets to that point. And um, as April said, be supportive, um, help that parent know what their rights are. A lot of parents have never experienced this before and are unaware of what's happening or who to call or what their you know legal rights are if they're if they're experiencing a safety plan then we can negotiate with other parties or figure out resources and hopefully again be as best prepared as we can be if it is going to court or you know potentially keep it out of court at all Thank you so much, Maggie and April. And I'm not, I'm thrilled to hear about the outcome for the client you were working with as well, April, um, and having your support throughout that process. I think one of the questions that has come up as well and something that I'm thinking of for Marty and Tim, if you could have your wish list of sort of the next steps in the research and advocacy that need to happen to make this really a nationwide movement um, to have ILO offices in every jurisdiction for parents, what would that wish, look, wish list look like? And what type of research do you think still remains to be done to build off of everything that you were able to find in this study? I don't wanna take away Tim's chance to make a good living, but we don't need research. Um, <laughs> This is evidence-based. This is gold standard. Um, those who won't join this effort, despite this study, are not going to be convinced to join this effort after more studies. You know, the, the, there's a very important idea uh, in this field um, that uh, the canon of uh, child welfare uh, is that uh, children should only be placed in foster care when necessary. Um, this study proves that we are not uh, upholding that canon. Um, giving children, parents, the best lawyer in town is an extremely child welfare friendly uh, goal because the goal of intervention is to help parents keep their children safely at home or to secure their safe return as quickly as possible. In other words, the goal of the system is identical for the family defender and the prosecutor and the judge, keeping families together whenever it's safe to do so. In criminal cases, there are divergent interests. The state seeks to punish guilty defendants. The defense seeks to avoid punishment, even when there's guilt. Um, but in this world, we are the best friend the judges and the child welfare administrators don't realize they have. But if we waste time on research, we are destroying needlessly the thousands of families that every day are lost, are separated and destroyed 
for no better reason than we don't have a genuine commitment to upholding the canon of child welfare. So um, I would build on Marty's comments by, by agreeing that we have some pretty good evidence that this works. Um, I think it would be really interesting to do research on what conditions uh, are ILOs implemented and why. So how do you actually move the field forward and get the implementation of an evidence-based practice like this and what are the levers we can use to, to, to get that more widely spread? Um, but, but there would be research colleagues of mine who would say, no, you need, you need another study. You got one study. Uh, you need something where it's more of a natural experiment, uh, more of a random controlled study, uh, random assignment study. Uh, I think if we could get qualified on FFPSA, that would be helpful. Uh, as a prevention services program. Uh, I think we probably will need more research to do that. Uh, as much as I share um, a lot of Marty's convictions that we shouldn't wait for that. Uh, we first started talking about um, studying this area, you know, when the first ILO was implemented and probably before that. It took years and years and years to get the funding for this study. And then it took years for us to conduct it. And I think in, in the real world, when you have good evidence of something, you ought to act on it. Kathleen, from your perspective in trying to get this expanded in Philadelphia, what do you see as the barriers and how can you envision using this study and the study that CLS has been doing to move this forward here and then perhaps um, across the state as well? Um, so first of all, I, I want to say that the study and CLS's work has actually already started to move the needle in Philadelphia. Um, so in uh, 2020, we got uh, early 2020, we got funding to hire April and another social worker um, and another attorney. So we expanded modestly. Um, we're excited to p expand more. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of ambiguity at this point because of COVID and what it has done to budgets. Um, my hope is that folks will continue to be forward thinking as they evaluate the cost of foster care and just how expensive the status quo is um, because we're gonna pay one way or another. And do you wanna pay for bad outcomes or for outcomes that actually work? So I think there's that dialogue happening. I, we have been very fortunate to have a lot of support from the Department of Human Services and Family Court. They recognize our model. They recognize that it works. Um, and so it's, a, I mean, it's an ongoing conversation. And then the question mark is what, where does COVID and COVID funding um, impact where, where we're headed? And the question that I, and we're getting almost close to our time. And so if you have other questions to our attendees, please do put them into the Q&A. Um, one of the things that has come up and obviously invoking Professor Roberts' work and the family regulation system, but how, how do you think and how does this study and your work as family defenders and studying family defense, how does that fit into the larger Black Lives Matter movement, Black Families Matter? And in talking about abolition versus reform, where do each of you who have worked so closely and for so long on these issues, um, where do you see that, that, uh, that issue coming down? Whoever wants to start off. <laughs> so a April um, commented on the shock at hearing me um, reveal my privilege. Um, and I, 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 I revealed it because it's so important to appreciate that we really live in uh, two worlds where privileged people don't have a clue how easy it is for a family to be destroyed by well-meaning people, how common it is, how familiar it is. It's so familiar that the communities ravaged by the family regulation system uh, live in agony and terror every day. 
And I live in a world where I don't know, my neighbors don't know anyone who's ever been in foster care or who lost a child to foster care. How do we get those people who believe because of the way our media covers this subject, that children are only removed when they must be and only when their parents are terrible, which is a falsehood of the highest order and the deepest insult to the parents living in poverty who are the uh, subjects of this system. Now, when you ask the question, what's the most if, uh, effective way to engage a political movement that causes people living in the privileged side of town to care about the people who live in the other side of town. I don't know the answer to that. I don't pretend to know the answer to that. I'm a lawyer, I'm an advocate. I know I can't go into the appellate division in my state and say the family regulation system needs to be abolished. Those judges will laugh me out of the courthouse. So I have to speak a language to try to persuade judges to do the right thing. But we need the community to stand up and demand justice. And justice is demanded by insisting that the privilege finally care about the unfairness that we wreak on the underprivileged. I don't know how to accomplish that. I don't live in a country that resembles that. And if, if there were an obvious answer, we wouldn't live in the country we live in. I, I love that answer so much and I struggle to improve upon it, but I do want to say I, I had the very good fortune to be at Penn Law just a few weeks ago to talk about abolition and, and talk about that conversation. and. I learned a lot. That video is available on Penn Law's uh, website. Um, if you're interested in the conversation around abolition, I encourage you to check it out. I think abolition is often uh, either misunderstood or misrepresented as an act of solely dismantling. In fact, abolition more than anything is an act of imagining and creating. And I hope that everybody in this room um, who's encountered the child welfare system agrees with me that we have to imagine something much better for our kids and our families. This is not working. Um, and it's not working in very racially disparate ways and very harmful ways for our families. So I'm excited about the abolition conversation because it invites me to dream and invites conversation about what would true safety look like for our families because this isn't it. Um, but in the meantime, we have to do something. And from my perspective, something that I can do every day is get out of bed and help a mom. And so I'm going to keep doing that as we continue to dream. I agree with Marty. It's going to take us to help us, quite frankly. Um, I'm not so optimistic that like one thing is going to happen and people are just going to recognize their privilege and say, oh, you know, let's, let's help the less privileged. Um, because as he stated, that's just not reality um, of our society today. But this is why this work is so important because you have someone to check um, what's going on right now. And this has to be grown. Like, like I walk in those shoes, you need more people who have been in those shoes, been in those communities, understanding um, that life to help people like us. And, and I say us because it is, it is us. You, you know, I can't, I, I'm shocked sometimes by the platforms that I end up on um, with my background and, and, and just the, how open our office was to not only hire me, I'm like, do you know of my background? Do you know of my record, right? <laughs> I don't even think I can be a kinship parent <laughs> at this point in time because of the ins and outs of what's just 
clearly flawed within the system. So a lot of parts, absolutely, like break it down, um, get 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 rid of what's not working. But as a society, um, and then I'm going into my personal views, as a society, we double down, even though we know this is not working. You can know that you're hurting families and all data can show that families are being hurt. But in order to recognize that, I have to deal with my own humanness. I have to deal with my own complex of my terrorism and saying, hey, I'm, I might be wrong. Black and brown families might be good parents. You know, I, I, maybe I might be wrong. And a lot of people are not willing to look at that. Like if I've given my life to be this savior and believe myself to be this savior, um, am I going to look at that I possibly was wrong? But that's what's going to be needed in order to like really just drastically change the system of people being open-minded enough to look at, I have to look at my own personal bias. Do I have empathy when it comes down to this parent? or because of this zip code or where this parent lives at, or am I automatically assuming that she don't know how to raise her child or he can't be involved in this family, you, you know? And that's what's not happening. I'm gonna double down and say, no, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm big, you're small, I'm rich, you're poor. And I'm going to continue this because this is all I know. So, and to people who have a drastic personal change, also societal change, to kind of let loose the rings, like you don't know everything, it's okay not to know everything, let's learn something different. Um, it's sad to say that much isn't going to change outside of, you know, small bits and pieces that we're trying to change as it stands now. I wanted to add that, um... <laughs> everything that's been said already, I agree with and was said better than I could. But I think a part of the shift is changing the narrative around this work and this field. And I, I do feel like I see glimpses of hope and the study was part of that and part of changing the narrative and the conversation. And today's webinar, I think, is part of that as well. And so I think that people are starting to talk about this work more in the context of the same breath as the Black Lives Matter movements and the, you know, defund the police movements and understanding the ways in which these systems are intertwined and have um, interrelated consequences. I don't- There's, there's some really interesting work being done by a group called Frameworks around changing the narrative. And I don't know how public it is yet, but they've done a lot of research on what, what ways that folks like us and on this, on this webinar can present these issues in ways that people hear, understand, and gravitate to. And a lot of, a lot of the things that, that we've been doing don't work. So myth busting, doesn't work. Using that kind of terminology, vulnerable families, doesn't work. Uh, and I'm really excited for when they are done and when their work becomes um, more public because I think it could really make a difference on how people see these issues. We are unfortunately at time. Uh, I think we could continue this conversation for, for a couple more hours and, and benefit so much from all of your insights. I wanna thank each and every one of you for sharing your personal stories in this work, your perspective, your expertise, and, and I hope moving the needle closer to justice for parents and children, which has been for so long, um, not really on anybody's radar. Um, and as I think Marty started us off with underappreciated, and as April so eloquently said, um, really not seen by the people who need to see it and need to be making the change. So I am also hopeful as Kathleen and Tim and Maggie have said um, that we will move closer with this webinar and our other efforts. We will be sending out, as I mentioned, a copy of the recording of this presentation, the links to all the materials that were referenced. Um, the last CLE passcode is internet. For those of you who didn't see the poll, Thank you again for joining us. Thank you again so much to Maggie, April, Kathleen, Tim, and Marty for your time um, and your wisdom today. And with that, uh, we will end our webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.